if I could say now what happened in this lifetime, I would use poetry. If I had to look back on the 70 years and explain to somebody, well, what was my life about? I would use poetry. I think we we sometimes imagine life as a future that we're negotiating the person we want to become and we're rational and we're logical it's like we're putting up a defense this is who I am but imagine if it was all over I'm imagining this for myself how would I like to say what happened And I would like to use poetry. I would like to say, I fell in love. I would like to say, I was blessed. I would like to say, I am grateful. Grateful is one of those really healthy, good dispositions that you can have in life to be grateful. And you can be grateful in a logical way. You can be grateful for a job you have or luck you got or some kindness that somebody did to you. But but, but gracefulness, like at a poetic level, is when you begin to say things like, I am grateful that it is morning. I am grateful for the sun. I am grateful for this autumn. I am grateful for the leaves that are falling. I am grateful for the music of the birds. Do you know what I'm saying? I think it's like a kind of poetry. And so if I could if I could look back and and try and describe what happened in my life, how would I sum it up? I would use poetry. I'd say that Saint Clare spoke to me from behind the hedge one time when I was cutting the hedge with the clippers and I was ten years of age. That's what I'd say. St. Clare spoke to me. And she said, Go. That's what she said. I thought she meant, like, stop cutting the hedge. Which I did. I stopped cutting the hedge. I took the clippers with me and left them in the garage and I went off for the day doing something else. I felt no longer burdened to be cutting the hedge because somebody had told me to go out and cut the hedge, do you know? It was like some of those little chores you had to do around the house when you were young. And there I was cutting the hedge and I was at the top of the hedge, I remember. Like, I don't mean the the top from the ground, but the top lengthwise. So to my left, as I looked down towards the, the roadway, there was a long... You know, there was a long stretch of hedge to be done. And there I was clipping, and there was St. Clare. Don't ask me why St. Clare. There was something about her, something about her and Francis. I must have seen a movie about them when I was young. Or maybe it was because I went to school in the poor Clare convent for the first two or three years of my primary school in Cavan, and and maybe somewhere I saw a picture on the wall, and maybe one of the nuns, there was a great nun in Cavan at the time, Mother Carmel. Everybody in Cavan, all the boys and girls in Cavan, and the kind of infants and that, we went through Mother, Mother Carmel's class, and everybody loved Mother Carmel. And for a couple of years then, when we grew up, in our 20s and 30s, Mother Carmel was sort of mythic, and she was still an old woman. And people would visit. I remember visiting her when I was an adult and being shocked that she was so tiny and so old and that she had hairs growing on her, under her nose, above her lip. Because, Because to me, she was like the mother, like the mother of God or somebody. She was like this divine mother. She was Mother Carmel. But I went back to her. She used to, and she'd say, I I always loved to, See my my boys coming back. 
I had a few minutes to chat with her and that was it, you know. It was a, it was a thing people did, you know, go back to the teacher. And she was there in the convent the whole time. And in that St. Clare's convent, uh, poor Clare convent, they never went outside the walls. It was one of the, the big, the big thing for enclosed, cloistered nuns was they never came out. You only ever saw them through a grill. And so even the fact that we were allowed in to be taught by Mother Carmel so that there was no grill between her and us. She was in the classroom with us. But there was something really mystical and special about her. And um, maybe at some stage she told us lovely stories about St. Clair and maybe, maybe Clare became a sort of presence in my life and maybe I saw a picture of her on the wall. I don't know. But there's no doubt that there I was at a very young age and Saint Clair, I was clipping the head and St. Clare spoke to me. And she said, go. And I thought, as I'm t- saying, I, I thought she meant the hedge, you know, give up, don't be bothered with the hedge, go and enjoy yourself. And I did. But that became a metaphor in my life for other ways where maybe when I felt, you know, chained to something, I would hear the voice saying, go, let it go. And it it freed me from a lot of places and careers that I could have been caught in because I was a teacher for a few years. I was a social worker for one year. I was a, a clerical priest, a minister for four years. You know, I, I was all those things which I loved and wanted to do, and yet then I got caught in the institutional pattern of it. And for a moment, you'd feel, I'm chained in this. You know, I will be stuck in this for the rest of my life. Because even in my 20s, there's no doubt I could see people who were, you know, tied up in, let's say, education, and they were teaching for 30 years, and they were jaded and exhausted. And somebody should have said, St. Clair should have said to them when they were in their 20s, go, put down the clippers and go. And that happened to me so many times. And not only in times, let's say, to leave teaching, but, but even to leave the clerical institutional church, you would think, well, St. Clair would be on the side of the institution. Why would she be telling you to go? But that's sometimes the wonderful thing about saints. They're not as, they're not as kind of uh, constrained within the church as you might imagine. It's like, it's like maybe they are when they're in this life, but then when they get to heaven, they sort of become loose, you know, they become wild. And there's a great wildness in the idea of heaven. It's a place that transcends all the institutions and all the barriers and all the all the frameworks that we set up in our perception as to what life is. What is my life? How will I explain it? How will I rationalize what I'm going to be for the next 10 or 20 or 30 years? And saints kind of liberate us from that. If you go inside into the room in your own heart and you begin to talk to the saints, they can kind of be very, very exciting, dangerous, liberating. They're not there to defend the institution of religion or to defend the, you know, the, the job that you're working in or the, the institution that, that you're involved with. No. The saints come to us with the most dynamic and sometimes subversive messages. And St. Clair came to me. I, I, I never forgot it, you know. That's why I feel it has a certain validity. So I'm speaking, I'm speaking about her, obviously, poetically. But I'm also... I'm also experiencing that there is a truth in the poetry. 
and that maybe the poetry is the truest way I could speak about this. If I have a memory of the saint speaking to me from behind the hedge, and I tell my therapist, well, she might rationalize it or she might deconstruct it. She might she might explain to me in rational terms how, you know, the the image or the notion of Saint Clare is triggered by the fact that I went to a primary school where Saint Clare was the main saint. But but no matter how much you could rationalize it as an idea and maybe maybe the therapist would say you might have been bored and you know dreading the fact that you had this big long hedge to cut and maybe maybe you were kind of releasing yourself maybe some dimension of your own unconscious was was saying get out of here there's loads of ways that you might rationalize we also i think sometimes forget that that all psychology is rational, all therapy is rational. It's it's based on principles of psych- psychological development, which have within it, you know, that word psychological, knowledge of the psyche in a way that is very, very structured and very, very cohesive in a logical way. Now, there are versions of of dealing with the unconscious which go into the dream world and that liberates but at the same time even there I think there's a danger that we're still dealing in in sort of archetypes or templates or or structures of thinking that flow cohesively one from the other when you use a metaphor when you when you open your heart to poetry, you you have transcended not just knowledge in the ordinary world of consciousness, but you really have transcended every dimension of human perception, whether it be conscious, unconscious, whether it be psychological or rational or scientific, all the ways that we constitute our knowing, ta olisogum, we say in Irish, but then we have this other phrase to know so we say we know all those things we know how how I'm behaving psychologically what my therapist says to me all that I can begin to understand and bring to the surface of consciousness and say well to olisogum I know now this stuff but but with God we say ahniam who the knowing of God is a way of knowing that transcends all those rational ways of perceiving the world. And when a saint comes to you, and I always think of the month of November as the time of saints. You know, we started with all saints day. It's like my my beloved had a wonderful dream one time. Uh, and it was just on the precipice of us purchasing a little house, and she dreamed of the house, and that twelve men came into the house and sat around in the kitchen all around the walls, and that was the dream. And it felt as a poem like the saints had arrived. Now, if she was going to a therapist, the therapist might have, you know, sorted that dream out in different ways. But sometimes it's sufficient to stay with the poetry of it. And and I know that for many years in faith, I used to deconstruct my faith, you know. I would think like if somebody said, do you believe in heaven? Do you believe in an afterlife? I would say, yes, yes, but, and then I'd go on to try and explain what afterlife might mean in rational terms. And it would also happen very particularly with the idea of the resurrection of of Jesus, that, you know, as Christians we believe 
that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, died and was buried, went to hell, and then from there he rose after the third day and ascended into heaven, where he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And at some stage in my lifetime, I came to a sense of embarrassment about that, a sense that we know too, too, too much now about evolution and we know too much about science to be conducting ourselves with those fairy tales. And we diminished the fairy tale aspect of it so that if somebody said to me, you're a Christian, so does that mean you believe in the resurrection? I'd begin to try and get all sorts of psychological, therapeutic ideas to make it reasonable and to make it rational. To make it rational, do you know? Uh, that That's some of the problem that happened in, in Western culture with faith, with religious faith, is is this, that our science and our knowledge and our understanding grew so much. And we were also inundated with so much darkness of war that we began to cling really, really tightly, gripped with two hands, we started to cling to this lifeboat of rational, you know. In the face of war, you tend to be rational. You tend, if you want to push yourself away from war, you tend to become rational, say, hold on to what is rational and reasonable. Don't, don't let the wild, dark blood of rage and anger possess you. So for loads of reasons, that's the way I was living for decades. If I was to talk about Christianity, I would rationalize it. And now I'm 70, and I'm kind of looking back on life, and I'm asking myself that question. You know, if I could say now what happened in my life, how would I say it? And my answer is I'd use poetry. I, I would use the metaphors, and I wouldn't deconstruct them. Because in some sense, the metaphors for me are the deepest layer of truth. And when I say that St. Clair spoke to me from behind the hedge, I'm not going to rationalize that any longer. I'm going to say to you, she did. She did. And I remember it, which is part of why it seems to endure within me as a truth. It's really interesting, you know, to go back on, on stuff that happened to you and and things you said, and and ways that you thought, and go back at them and try and see, did that moment or that insight live with you for the rest of your life? It's amazing, because sometimes, if I go back in my diary, I can read things that I wrote at a rational level, and I'm reading the diary from 20 years ago or 40 years ago, and I don't even know who it is that's talking. It It seems so... Strange to me because I'm looking at, I'm looking at the me who was thirty years of age or the me who was eighteen years of age, and and that person is writing their diary, rationalizing their emotions or whatever, and it's just totally remote from me. It's not me. So am I me? Am I the same person as I was then? And there's a way that. You know, the, the Buddhist tradition is very beautifully strong on this, about the non-existence of self. That, that we're constantly changing, that, that there is no self that you can find that is a continuum, substantial continuum. It's, it's like in each moment there's a dynamic changing and there's, there's karma arising and there's, there's your responses to it so that you have the senses and, and you're being bombarded through the senses with with stuff and it's interesting there's, there's one slight difference as far as i know is like in a lot of buddhism in tibet 
they see the mind actually as, as one of the senses. So they said the six senses rather than five. And that extra sense, they, they talk about the mind, you know, as the engagement when things arise, disturbing emotions or ideas come into the mind. That, that does, you know, you're engaging, there's a dynamic of engaging with them. And they too change you. So that the self doesn't have the kind of solidity that we go around thinking we have. We go around thinking, I am me. Like, I'm not only am I me, I'm the most important person in the room. That's how we think. But the beautiful thing about Buddhist reflections in this area of non-existence of the self is that you come to a sense that it's like a river, you know? It's like a river. It's like a strange bombardment of fluidity. And it's only when you detach from all that at every level, including at the mental level, when you detach, even from ideas, that, that you begin to find illumination or, or Buddhahood and, and oneness, like an interdependence with all beings and all things that allows you to feel compassion. It's very beautiful. Where where does where does the Catholic thing or the Christian thing change from that? I I think it does in terms that there is a sense of self, which is solid. This is me. But there are also different layers of other selves within, and the deepest one, the foundational one, is is the self that is Christ. So I, it is no longer me, but Christ who speaks in me, that kind of. So there's layers of self, and there's layers of way, ways of seeing, ways of understanding. What happened in my life? Who am I? What, how would you write the story of it? And they're mostly logical. And the logical ones fall away. And so when I read my diary from 40 years ago, that seems like a different person. That seems like, oh, he's a young person with these psychological senses of himself, but, but that they're not the psychological senses of myself that I have now because I'm not that person. I'm a different self. Okay. Is there any continuum? Is there any continuum between then and now, between me when I was young as a child, or now? And the answer is yes. There's one. And it's the metaphor and the poem. When I think, when I think of the metaphors, you know, Patrick Kavanagh said when he was young, I had a, oh, what was it? I had a prayer, like a rose on the Virgin Mary's blouse. Beautiful metaphor. But it's like he's remembering that so long ago, but he's also, it seems to me, in that poem, Christmas Childhood, he's still experiencing that that sense of wanting to have a prayer, like a rose pinned on the Virgin Mary's blouse. It's a poem. And the strange thing for me is that when I talk about the poetic layers of my life, They don't seem strange. They don't seem far away in the past. They seem to be kind of floating in an eternal present and that they manifest at multiple times in my life. St. Clair spoke to me from behind the hedge. I was a young child clipping the hedge. She said, go. And that, that eternal moment has recurred many, many times in my life. The same moment. The moment when I was teaching and I was agonizing because I really, really loved teaching. Oh, I loved teaching. I was in, I was in West Cavan. 
I was very happy. I was falling in love. I was thinking about marriage and children. I was thinking about, I enjoyed my work. I was working in Lachan House as a teacher. I loved it. And then one day, St. Clair is speaking to me from behind the hedge. And I'm like seven years of age, or ten. And she's saying, go. So I left the teaching job. I got a job as a social worker. When I remembered the moment, go, the instructions of the saint, go, let go. Don't feel enslaved, go. I remember a great writer saying to me, I've quoted it many times, Tom McIntyre. He said, jump off the cliff blindfolded. Not just jump off the cliff, cliff, but jump off the cliff blindfolded. It's an attitude to life sometimes. When, when love beckons, and it may be, it may be a lover in your life, or it may be a new experience, or it, it may be a new job, it may be to travel, to go, to to change who you are. And when that happens in your life, when you're when you're called, you you feel you're being called into this new world. And you struggle with it because you say, Well, I don't want to leave the job I have. I don't want to leave where I'm living. You know, you're comfortable where you are. You've developed a sense of who you are. It's nice and solid and cozy. And when you, de- when you develop a strong sense of who you are, that is very solid and that's very cozy. And when you don't know who you are, when you're confused about who you are, that's, that makes you vulnerable. And this gets worse the older you get. It's, it's, you know, I used to love when I'd be touring, ten, even ten years ago, 20 years ago, let's say, 2007, 2008, and I was touring with a one-man show. And I used to love going to a different place. Might go to Kilmallock or Cork City, and I'd book a hotel for the night. And I used to love being in the strange hotel and, you know, oh, the corridors and the bar and the reception and checking in and checking. I just loved it. And I'd walk the streets of different towns, and I'd, I used to love that. But, but nowadays, because I'm older, I'm, I'm used to my own habits, I find it much, much more attractive to go and do the show when I'm touring. So I go to Port Leash or Tullamore last week or whatever, and I do the show, and then what do I do? I get into the car and I drive home to my own bed. And it's so like old man behavior, you know. I want my own little comforts. I want to wake up in my own bed in the morning, that kind of thing. But I'm still, I'm still called out. I'm still sometimes wrestling with, should I let go of the comfort of my own identity and risk this other moment? A place it happens for me sometimes now would be socially that as you get older you don't like going into social situations it's like easier to sit at home and watch watch the telly and if you have to go to some party or some family do you're you're reluctant to go you'd prefer and stay at home and and again, it's like because at home you have your own sense of who you are and you're comfortable. And if you go out into a strange world, even for 10 minutes, even for an hour, even for just an afternoon for a party, there's a way you don't know who you are. Because you're meeting new people. All the time when we go out from ourselves, we feel vulnerable. And, and that's scary. And sometimes it's really good to go out from yourself. And sometimes you need St. Clair behind the hedge 
saying, go, you know, do it. You'll never, you'll never regret taking those kind of risks. And St. John of the Cross says, I, I went out from myself, leaving myself forgotten among the lilies. There's, there's a way when you go out from yourself, you lose yourself. You know, you forget yourself. When you're engaged with somebody socially at the party and you're just chatting to them and, and you focus on them and, and their life is interesting and it's like your consciousness begins to shift into their world. You're following their story and it's really beautiful. But you've forgotten yourself. There's a great freedom in that. But sometimes it's scary. Sometimes you'd be afraid. You, you like to be just thinking in your own head about yourself. So the moments recur for me, that moment of St. Clair saying go, is a, is a poetic way of saying it. It's a, it's a metaphor. But it happened as a metaphor. It's not that I constructed it as a metaphor. It's not that I imagined and, and said, oh, I'll, I'll say that this was St. Clair. No, it, it was completely coming up out of the ground. It was coming up out of the unconscious. It was coming up into the universe from God. It was a manifestation of a saint. St. Clair spoke to I could feel it was St. Clair. I didn't, as a child, I didn't say, who's this? It was St. Clair. Why would it be St. Clair? I don't know, but it was St. Clair. This lovely saint, this beautiful, wise woman who is in heaven, who has lived her life here, friend to St. Francis. The woman who began the poor Clare order. Gone to heaven. For hundreds of years she's there in heaven. And she reaches out to me. So, so through her is the ground of all being opening up to me. The, the limitless capacity of the depth of my soul being the depth of God's love within me. This, this immeasurable presence. It manifests as St. Clair. She's channeling something that's so unnameable and so incomprehensible and so without any parameters that the energy has to be described, again with a metaphor, as light. The light, you know, the light of heaven. And the light of heaven is shining through her. And maybe it was, maybe it was the sunshine on the tiny little leaf of the box hedge. Maybe, maybe just a slanting sun made that hedge so beautiful for a moment with the light behind it, beyond it, that I got a sense of presence. And that's the way the metaphor works. There's somebody there. And we've all been in those moments when you're standing in nature, you're standing in a sunset or close to a hedge or a tree or a falling leaf. And there's something about the light. There's something about how it bombards your sensual being. And you feel it like a presence. You're experiencing God in the metaphor. And that's how I experienced it. And that's how I would describe it. These are metaphors, poetic ways of talking. Words that, that reach beyond the rational and they're the only way that I can penetrate what is called life. I am here. I am present. Y you are here. Let's think about this just for a minute. Being here now. You are here. You are here and you hear my voice. Okay. So my voice is coming from 
a different time zone, a different moment. And my being here speaks to you even though you are not in this time moment, in this geographical place. And yet you are here. And I can say with you, I am here with you. I'm present. But that's not in a rational world. That's not something artificial intelligence might read. If the robot walked into the room, let's say in this future where we're going to be encountering artificial intelligence, so a robot walks into the room, and I, I, I'm saying these things to you, I'm saying, I am here. The robot's not going to get it like that I am here with you. Every part of the technology of the microphone and the way that you're listening to it on a speaker, all that the robot will get. But will the robot get the real deep way that I mean I am here? I don't think so. I am here at a deeper level and the more I remain still and silent and release myself from the violence of any action, then the deeper I go and the deeper I sink into the time being, into, into time being, not time linear, but time being. I sink deeper and deeper into the moment until I'm floating as like on an ocean and all the phenomena around me are floating as like illusions. How can I say this in the world we live in, where people have committed so stridently to science, to rational thought and the importance of the self? Well, how can I say it? The answer is, how can I not say it? How could I dare to be silent in the face of the world? You know, as well as feeling a sense of continuum in metaphors, the metaphors where I say something like, my guardian angel is always close to me. It's, it's a poem, it's a metaphor, but yet, that has a continuum that I can connect with the child writing that in his diary, or the 25-year-old writing it in his diary. All through my life, I can say, I have felt the presence of the angel at my shoulder. The metaphor is actually the real hinge on which we awaken, on, on, on which we live into the present moment. And I remember the dead, everywhere, through my life, always in life we are in the midst of death. I remember it on Clare Island, old men being carried across the rocks in coffins, with the priest at the head of the procession to lead the way. A priest who is now himself dead. I remember a little child, the little body of a, a tiny infant one time, in a mortuary, the beautiful, beautiful perfection of that body. And the first man I saw dead in a coffin, it was behind double doors in an old house on Bridge Street in Cavan. And I, I, I went in like, oh, I must have been five or six. And I was in my granny's house, and she said the man up the road was dead, and I went up and I saw the big black ribbon on the door, and it was one of those ancient doors, you know, where they had two, two bits to it. And I went in. And the people welcomed me in as, you know, they thought it was a nice thing that the little child had come to see the dead. And I was terrified. And there was something about it so final, so silent like stone in the coffin. And I remember my mother and the last kiss before the lid of the coffin was put on. I remember my father, 
my father's body. And most recently, a neighbor, and I spoke about her in a podcast about two weeks ago, stretched beside the kitchen window in her coffin. Beside the kitchen window, they said, because she loved looking out that same window. All those, all those people, all those dead, I do not see them at that real level. I see them like with Patrick Kavanagh who said about his mother, I do not see you lying in the cold wet clay of a Monaghan graveyard. I see you walking at evening along the road. Beautiful poem in memory of my mother by Patrick Kavanagh and A Christmas Childhood by Patrick Kavanagh. Two beautiful poems. Sacramental poems, poems that really allowed the idea of metaphor to conflict with rational perceptions and where the metaphor triumphs and wins out. And that to me is real poetry. And that to me is faith. And that to me is the way that I would like to remember my life and reflect on my life, always in terms of metaphor and poem. St. Clare spoke to me from the other side of the hedge. She said, go. She whispered, go. She spoke to the very depth of my heart. And that moment was eternal, is eternal. It recorded in time. In linear time, that moment repeated itself. Where I struggled whether to stay in safety or whether to risk something new and venture forward and, and, and jump over the cliff into the ocean of love. And every time when I was afraid, St. Clair would always be there whispering, Go, do it. Take the risk. Be so deeply yourself that you are beyond yourself and find your new self in Christ. Go, trust, risk everything. You remember Nicodemus came. He says to Jesus at night, he came at night because he didn't want anyone to know. And he says to Jesus, well, you know, what does it cost to follow you? And your man says, well, you know, Obey the commandments, honor God and, and love your neighbor. And Nicodemus said, I do all that. I do all that. What, what else? And Jesus said, well, I suppose sell everything you have and give it to the poor and then follow me. And Nicodemus went away sad. He couldn't do it. That was too much. If St. Clair was there, she would have said, Go, go on, Nicodemus, do it. So, I have no, I have no rational reason for celebrating St. Clair. I have no rational understanding about how my life has moved from one, you know, accident to another. And most of the more, more beautiful and wonderful things that have happened to me in life, when I look back, I realize I actually didn't control them. I didn't choose any of the things that I ended up doing in life. The big things always happened through accidents. So, so the deepest way that I can understand my life is the metaphor. Is the poem, is belief in the saints, is belief in heaven, is belief in the resurrection, is belief that even in death it may be a stumbling block for atheists, but for we who believe it is a pathway into the eternity of God's presence. When we confront our own death, we confront a door of possibility. 
It's the biggest moment. It's the biggest moment of risk. It's the biggest moment of go. It's that voice of St. Clair saying, go. Fall into the abyss and trust in God. Or as your man said again, the great Messiah in the boat, when everybody was terrified, and he wakes up and he says, be not afraid. Don't be afraid. Go. Risk it. Do it. Be it. And that's about it. That's about it. It's the, the beautiful month of November. And I love speaking about saints, the communion of saints, the kind of sense of, of all those wonderful kind of beings eternally with you and minding you and whispering to you and giving you intimations of your own deepest self. And I like to think that gathered around them are the people that we have known in this life and loved in this life. Mothers and fathers, children, friends and relations who have passed away and that they too are part of that communion of sin. All, all with us, eternally, in the one moment. All, forever, for eternity, here, now. Be here now. Be present. And thank you for being here.